Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Virtual Grand Round Educational Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ray Grant, Director of Education at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm the moderator for this series. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Daniel Antoneda. Dr. Antoneda is a member of the staff at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis. He received his medical training in Ecuador and then his residency in neurology and neuroimmunology at the Cleveland Clinic. He has completed his master's in biostatistics and epidemiology at Case Western Reserve University and is now in a PhD program in clinical research. His research is focused on advanced imaging techniques for MS as well as the role of vitamin D in MS pathogenesis. Dr. Antoneda will talk today about the thorny issue of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy emergent in the MS population on natalizumab. He will discuss how we stratify and reduce risk, monitor patients for the onset of PML, diagnose this condition, and ultimately, what treatments we can try to bring to the table for this aggressive and potentially fatal complication of our therapeutics. Dr. Antoneda. Thanks so much, Alex, for that introduction. Welcome to this session on managing PML in the multiple sclerosis patient. My name is Daniel Antoneda, and I will be walking you through uh, this interesting topic over the next 30 minutes. On this slide are my disclosures. I received consulting fees from Accorda Therapeutics, Biogen Eidic, Alkermes, Genzyme, and Novartis. I would like to acknowledge the aid of Dr. Robert Fox, um, one of the staff members at the Mellon Center Cleveland Clinic, for his discussions on this topic and contributions to the current presentation. So I want to start out with a case, um, just so we can pique everybody's interest in this topic. So a 42-year-old female patient with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, uh, who has been on natalizumab treatment for the past five years. Um, she has been stable clinically and radiologically. She now presents with worsening cognitive complaints and vision, and vision disturbance. What additional information is key to guide the following steps in diagnosis is the first question I want to ask. What laboratory or imaging studies are needed? And third, should empiric therapy be started for suspected PML? What we'll try to do is answer these three questions uh, during the course of this lecture. The learning objectives are to review the pathophysiology and risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which I will be referring to as PML from here on out, in natalizumab-treated patients. We will identify the steps to recognize and diagnose PML in patients with multiple sclerosis, and we'll also recognize the management op options for emergent PML associated with natalizumab treatment. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or PML, is a rare complication of natalizumab treatment. It is caused by reactivation of latent John Cunningham virus. Initially, PML was described in patients with AIDS. It was initially described to have a high mortality uh, due to the fact that AIDS was it's mostly a condition that was not possible to treat uh, back when this was first described. Um, and in multiple sclerosis, PML does have a high mortality, but not quite as high as initially described in ACE patients, 20 to 25% of patients in natalizumab cases. There's no proven effective treatment for PML, and it is thought to be related to decreased CNS immune surveillance associated with natalizumab treatment. Just to review a little bit, the mechanism of action of natalizumab. Natalizumab is a monoclonal antibody which binds to alpha-4 integrin and blocks lymphocyte adhesion to endothelial cells, thereby decreasing the influx of lymphocytes into the central nervous system. The pathophysiology for the development of PML is still quite debated. There are schools of thought that consider PML to be caused by a reactivation of JC virus, which is latent in brain tissue. And when a patient is treated with natalizumab, it is possible that the decreased immune surveillance in the brain causes uncontrolled viral replication and therefore the development of PML. An alternative hypothesis suggests that the activation of JC virus may actually occur in the periphery, and that could be in the bone marrow. Um, it is known that natalizumab has effects on the bone marrow, um, and a competing hypothesis is that natalizumab may increase the replication of JC virus through indirect mechanisms in the bone marrow. Of the two schools, or of the two hypotheses, um, certainly the hypothesis of JC virus being latent in brain tissue and then growing in brain tissue after exposure to PML is the one which is currently favored. 
how to determine the risk for PML. There are three main factors that determine risk of PML in atezolizumab-treated patients. That is the presence of latent JC virus infection, which can be determined serologically, if there has been prior immunosuppressant use, and duration of treatment with natalizumab. So let's move on to case number one. 57-year-old female with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis has been on natalizumab for four years and was previously exposed to mitoxantrone therapy. JC virus serology is positive, but she wishes to continue treatment. Which of the following would be most accurate in terms of her risk? A, risk for PML is 0.1 in 1,000. B, the risk for PML is 5 per 1,000. C, the patient is not at risk for PML as she was previously treated with mitoxantrone. And D, risk for PML is approximately 11 per 1,000. The answer here is risk for PML is approximately 11 per 1,000. And we will review this data in the following slides. So patients who are JC serology negative have a risk of more or less 0.1 per 1,000. Um, more technically correct would be 0.07 in terms of the last data. And then for patients who are JC virus serology positive, we have broken down the risk of PML based on duration of treatment that you can see in the second column and the presence or absence of prior immunosuppression in the third and fourth columns. So patients who are treated for the first 24 months without prior immunosuppression have a risk about 0.7 per 1,000. Patients treated for, for 25 to 48 months with no prior immunosuppression have a risk of 5.3 per 1,000. Patients who have been treated between 25 and 48 months, like the case we just saw, with a history of prior immunosuppression, which is mitoxantrone, have a risk of approximately 11.2 per 1,000. The risks at month 49 and 72 are not entirely clear due to the small numbers of patients treated with natalizumab for that duration of treatment and are likely to change as data accumulates. The majority of natalizumab-treated patients still do not develop PML, even those who are JC virus positive. It is probable that there are specific mutant strains of JC virus that replicate quicker and are probably more aggressive in their growth. It's also likely that host factors in terms of host immunity might play a role. And recently, the JC virus index has emerged as an additional risk stratification tool, which can be followed serially. How is PML diagnosed? There actually is AAN consensus criteria that was published in 2013 by Berger and colleagues for making a diagnosis of PML. Two main ways of making the diagnosis. One is using pathology, where one there are specific pathologic criteria for a diagnosis of PML on a biopsy of CNS tissue. And the second way of diagnosing is without pathological confirmation. This can be done using clinical, radiological, and laboratory, mostly CSF features. So how do we recognize PML? The clinical manifestations uh, typically begin with cognitive symptoms. Behavior changes are common. Motor symptoms can occur, gait abnormality and incoordination, sensory loss, language or speech disturbance, visual symptoms, headache, and occasionally seizures and paroxysmal events, which are not uncommon. Radiologically, what does PML look like? It is associated with increased T2 flare signal on an MRI. Typically, the lesions of PML are hypointense on T1. They typically are bright on diffusion-weighted images. There's a relatively little mass effect associated with PML lesions. An enhancement is possible, but it's not common, especially on early presentation of PML. The lesions typically do involve the great white matter junction, and the frontal lobe is a predominant location, but we know that PML can affect multifocally, and it also affects atypical locations, including cerebellum, brainstem, and even basal ganglia. Here is an example of PML. This is a patient who was treated with natalizumab. You can see the minus 18 months, there's not really much signal change. When you see minus six months, it's unclear if there's any early changes. And then at onset of PML, you can see a T2 flare abnormality in the left frontal lobe, which is spanning the great white matter junction and has minimal mass effect. As you can see on the bottom row of MRIs, it is not associated with any contrast enhancement and it, is in, and it is hypo-intense on T1 imaging. How do we recognize PML from a laboratory standpoint? 
CSF testing using ultra-sensitive PCR for JC virus has a very high sensitivity, up to 95%. The NIH lab also conducts specific JC virus PCR, called the major lab, and has high sensitivity. White blood cells typically are less than 20, and there can be high protein, but it is not unusual for the protein even to be normal. Serum JC virus is not really helpful in the acute setting of diagnosis, and another point is that negative CSF JC virus PCR does not exclude the presence of PML. The diagnostic criteria allow for definite, probable, and possible categories of diagnosis of PML. When clinical features, imaging features, and CSF JC virus PCR is present, a definite diagnosis can be made. If there is clinical features, but there are no clinical features compatible with PML, but imaging features are negative, but JC virus PCR is positive, this would be a probable diagnosis. And likewise, if there is no clinical features, but one can see early imaging changes of PML and positive JC virus PCR, that would also mean a probable diagnosis. A possible diagnosis typically occurs when there is only positive JC virus PCR or when there is positive clinical and imaging features in the absence of JC virus PCR and CSF. What are diagnostic pearls to take into account in cases of PML? Any clinical relapse on natalizumab or any new T2 lesion development should be an alert sign to the possibility of PML. Screening of symptoms prior to natalizumab infusions are key for early identification of possible PML. Infusion nurses should be trained to recognize these early clinical signs and symptoms of PML and call physicians promptly for evaluation prior to natalizumab infusions. MRI changes are likely to predate clinical symptoms, hence there it's very important to frequently monitor these patients with serial MRI. Currently at our center, MRIs are conducted every six months in patients who, have, who are treated with natalizumab and in high-risk groups can be conducted even every three months. Let's move on to case two. Same patient, after weighing her options, decides to continue with natalizumab. Routine MRI of the brain shows a large lesion in the gray-white matter junction of the right frontal lobe, which is non-enhancing and previously was not present. She has no new symptoms. What is the best course of action? Continue lanolizumab as her symptoms have not changed. Obtain urgent CSF and await JC virus PCR. Start high-dose corticosteroids for presumed silent MS brain lesions. Or obtain urgent CSF and start plasma exchange empirically. As an answer for this question, I have marked D although certainly B would be an option. The key point here is that CSF needs to be obtained urgently for confirmation of PML infection, and the decision to start plasma exchange empirically will be based on the clinical suspicion for PML present based on the history, physical examination, and imaging features. Now we are going to enter the main topic of this lecture, which is treatment of PML and MS. Treatment of PML and MS typically involves a two-pronged approach. On the one hand, antiviral therapies, and on the second hand, immune reconstitution. There are significant challenges to developing treatment strategies of PML. One, it is difficult to culture JC virus in the lab, and therefore knowing which agents are most effective against it is somewhat of a challenge. Second, there's no adequate animal model for testing of therapies, and therefore identification of molecules or compounds is made more difficult. And third, PML is a relatively rare disease. There's not a lot of cases, and therefore there's lack of good treatment evidence to guide therapy in individual patients. Antiviral therapies for PML are used commonly and can be broken down into basically four main groups. One are nucleoside analog antivirals. These are medications such as cytarabine, sidofavir, and a new agent, CMX001, which is actually a derivative of sidofavir. We also have 5H2 serotonin receptor antagonists. These include risperidone and mirtazapine. And we also have cytokine-based therapies, including interferon alpha. One note of caution should be that interferon alpha can actually worsen 
underlying MS, and therefore is not a treatment which is typically used in the treatment of PML associated with natalizumab. Mefloquine, an antimalarial agent, is also known to have prop antiviral properties active against JC virus and can be used. Let's go a little, through a little bit of the information regarding these therapies. So for cetirabine, there was a trial that examined its use in PML, and it actually failed. Sedofavir had a trial that was actually negative, plus showed marked toxicity. In terms of cytokines, interferon, ther interferon alpha, a trial was conducted and did not show positive results. And antimalarial, such as mefloquine, had a trial, but it was stopped due to lack of efficacy. The bottom line here is that antiviral therapies on their own are probably not sufficient to treat PML. It is not clear that there is a therapy that actually makes a difference in terms of an antiviral effect on the course of PML, but these therapies are commonly used irrespective. The mainstay of treatment for PML is actually immune reconstitution. The idea is, if PML has been created by decreased immune surveillance of lymphocytes, which have been blocked through the monoclonal antibody natalizumab against alpha-4 integrin, one tries to accelerate the process of immune reconstitution. The first step to accomplish this goal is to hold natalizumab while the PML workup is being conducted. Second, we can accelerate the clearance of natalizumab once PML has been confirmed or if it is suspected using two main options. One would be plasma exchange and one immunoabsorption. We are going to cover plasma exchange in detail. So, the question of is plasma exchange effective at, decreasing, at increasing the clearance of natalizumab has actually been studied um, in 2009 by Kotri and colleagues. After a natalizumab infusion, it can be seen here in both graphs that after successive PLEX sessions, the actual serum concentration of natalizumab, calculated in micrograms per milliliter, decreases significantly compared with historic controls who did not receive PLEX. And the idea is that in many of these patients, by 21 days, the concentration of natalizumab was below 5 micrograms per ml. Now, the second question is, sure, we can wash natalizumab out of the body, and we can decrease the concentrations of natalizumab, but the other question is, well, what happens to the alpha-4 integrin molecule. Does it remain saturated or does plasma exchange actually have an effect? So this can be observed in the graph on the right side, where we are looking on the x-axis as the time point and on the y-axis at the mean alpha-4 integrin saturation percentage. And you can see that the patients who were plexed to a low, less than one microgram concentration of natalizumab those patients tended to desaturate, those patients are in blue, and tended to desaturate the alpha-4 integrin receptors rapidly compared to those patients who had historic controls in black or the patients who had plex with a goal concentration greater than 1 micrograms per ml. So this essentially provided some evidence that conducting plasma exchange and conducting plasma exchange with a goal of a low plasma concentration of natalizumab was actually effective at decreasing the saturation of alpha-4 integrin and therefore allowing lymphocyte reconstitution back into the brain. This is a PLEX model stimulation that I'm going to show in the next slide. So once again, on the x-axis, we have the time and days since the onset of PML, um, and on the y-axis, we have serum natalizumab concentration in micrograms. So you can see that a patient who has a natalizumab concentration right after a treatment, um, which is indicated by the arrow, by the arrow um, a treatment of natalizumab, probably can peak up anywhere between 100 and 140 micrograms per ml. This will drop slowly over the course of seven days as natalizumab um, uh, as the second dose of natalizumab is awaited. And in this hypothetical situation, a patient would have developed symptoms close to day seven, and plasma exchange would have been initiated. 
As you can see, with each successive plasma exchange session, there is a, a further drop in the concentration of natalizumab in serum. Until after the fifth uh, plasma exchange session, there is a very low to undetectable concentration of natalizumab left. This is the point um, indicated in purple where there is less than one microgram per ml of natalizumab. And you can compare this with the saturation of alpha-4-1 integrin in the darker gray area. Once again, with plasma exchange, there is a transient drop. With each successive um, treatment, there is a further drop in the, cons in the alpha-4 integ um, alpha integrin saturation, which is indicated um, by the label on the Y axis on the far right of the graph. And furthermore, you can notice that in a patient, in a historic control, for example, patient who would continue natalizumab, who would stop natalizumab and not get plasma exchange, the time to reach the less than one microgram per ml concentration would take 97 days instead of the approximately 15 days that it takes with natalizumab. So, bottom line is that five plasma exchange sessions every other day will reduce natalizumab concentrations to less than one microgram per ml in more than 95% of patients by, 95, by 15 days. And a comparable reduction without plasma exchange would take an additional 82 days. In terms of natalizumab PML management, the most important thing is to risk stratify early. The key goal here should be the prevention of PML. If one can identify patients who are at high risk of natalizumab-associated PML and transition them to a medication with a more safe profile, that should be done in all cases. However, there are patients who have aggressive disease course and who despite positive JC virus status and in high risk of PML, a decision is made by a physician to continue natalizumab. There is a third situation in which patients are willing to take an additional risk despite knowing the numbers of a high incidence of PML infection. If one can risk stratify, one can prevent PML altogether. But if a patient, for clinical reasons or because of patient-specific reason, decides to continue treatment with natalizumab, it is key to put in place a method for early diagnosis of PML. How is that done? That is done with frequent MRIs every six months or every three months, even if needed, and screening of signs and symptoms of PML prior to each natalizumab infusion. If patients are to develop symptoms which are concerning, early MRI, sensitive JC virus PCR, and repeat if it's negative. Once PML is suspected, as discussed earlier, early cessation of natalizumab is important up front, and natalizumab should be held during PML workup. Plasmapheresis immunoabsorption should be initiated to decrease the amount of circulating natalizumab with the final goal of decreasing alpha-4 integrin saturation and allowing reconstitution of the immune system in the brain. Consider using putative antiviral therapies as described above. Although the evidence behind these therapies is not strong, they still can be used and are still recommended. A potential treatment protocol developed by the Consensus Conference in the International Journal of MS Care in 2014 suggested a protocol that included early initiation of PLEX, sidofovir, followed by interferon alpha, followed by mefloquine, and even mirtazapine. The idea behind this potential treatment protocol is affecting the virus at different levels of replication and causing restoration of the immune system. Treatment pearls in terms of PML. PML is a serious complication of natalizumab therapy, and the benefits and risk of treatment should be weighed carefully as treatment options for PML are limited, as discussed previously. If PML is suspected, a negative JCV PCR does not rule out the infection, and repeat JCV should be pursued. In cases of high suspicion, compatible imaging and clinical features when PSR is pending, PLEX should be initiated empirically. Once again, this will depend ultimately on the clinician's judgment of the likelihood of PML. But in a patient 
who has a clinical history and imaging features compatible with PML, delaying initiation of plasma exchange could have untowards effects. The time turnaround time for JC virus PCR may take up to several days, and therefore this should be considered carefully. Now I want to talk about one of the potential complications of immune reconstitution in patients treated with plasma exchange for PML. The immune inflammatory reconstitution syndrome, or IRIS, may occur early at the time of diagnosis, but more commonly occurs late, typically days to weeks after initiation of plasma exchange. What happens in immune inflammatory reconstitution syndrome is a rapid reconstitution of inflammatory cells. As the inflammatory cells re-enter the central nervous system, they are directed at destroying active viral replication, and this produces significant damage of surrounding neurological tissue. It is characterized clinically by worsening neurological symptoms. The MRI shows an increased lesion load and can even show enhancement, typically does, and some mild mass effect and edema. Prompt treatment of this inflammatory state is recommended to limit ongoing inflammation. This is an example from the same patient who developed PML that I showed you before, who developed iris. So you can see in the third column of MRIs is the onset of PML, where there is that white matter lesion, gray white matter lesion junction, junction lesion in the frontal in the left frontal lobe. And as you can see, two weeks after onset of PML, the lesion appears to be stable. There may be some progression. And then at a month and a half, or the 1.5 months after PML onset, after this patient was treated with plasma exchange, you can notice that there is an expansion of the T2 lesion and associated contrast enhancement. This worsens over time, as you can see, um, in the three-month column and four-month column. How is iris treated? Typically, IV methylprednisolone, a gram a day for five days, is initiated promptly at the time of iris diagnosis. One can continue oral steroids after IV steroids for approximately one to two months, and commonly, repoint steroid pulses are needed for worsening clinical symptoms or worsening MRI features. Merivirac is an antiviral medication which has been proposed and is currently being studied in AIDS-associated PML, which may help prevent as well as treat iris, but is still considered an investigational therapy. In summary, PML is a rare but potentially fatal or markedly disabling complication of natalizumab therapy. Clinical and imaging screening are needed to make a prompt diagnosis. If PML does develop, prompt initiation of plasma exchange with five sessions is recommended to clear natalizumab and cause immune reconstitution. Antivirals may be used in addition to plasma exchange, but evidence for their use is limited. Worsening after plasma exchange is most likely related to iris, and prompt imaging and steroid treatment should be initiated. With this, I want to conclude my talk. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope these slides have been useful for identification, prevention, and treatment of PML in the MS patient. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Onneda, for elegantly reviewing what is a bit of a moving target. As we speak, the statistics are changing, better focusing our thoughts on who can use natalizumab and at what risk. Clinically, it's probably important to get a good handle on three different risk calculations. How much risk for PML is this patient willing to take? Each individual has their own accounting of how they think of risk, and it is the clinician's job both to understand that risk conception as well as to realistically guide the patient using best medical evidence. We also need to get a sense of how much risk of PML are we as clinicians caring for a patient willing to accept. Would we be devastated if one of our patients got a severe case of PML, or would we count this as a reasonable cost for the many other patients that are helped by this therapy? Finally, what do we think the risk of this patient's MS causing severe disability is? We need to remember it's not just the risk of PML emergent on natalizumab, but the combined risk of ongoing MS activity, risk during natalizumab treatment, 
and risks of coming off of treatment and going on yet another treatment. Thank you for your engagement in this activity. Don't forget to apply for your CME credit. We look forward to your participation in other topics in this series.